Today, I'm going to talk to you about self-control. And most of us struggle with self-control because we have different kinds of preferences at different points in time. So if you ask me right now how I'd like my day to go tomorrow, I'll tell you I'd like to get up at 7, run a couple of miles before breakfast, have a productive work day, come home, cook a healthy dinner of fish and vegetables, and get to bed nice and early. But when tomorrow comes, I'm more likely to prefer to hit the snooze button, sleep until noon, spend the day reading interesting articles on Wired.com, uh, grab a cheeseburger and fries for dinner, and stay up late watching movies. Right? So obviously, if I gave in to these temptations, I would really regret it. Uh, so the question is, how do we get ourselves to do today what we aspired to do yesterday. So in the battle for self-control, we have a couple of weapons at our disposal. The first is called willpower, and willpower is the ability to resist temptations when they're sitting right in front of us. Some of the most famous studies on willpower were done by the psychologist Walter Michel, who looked at willpower in children using the famous marshmallow test, which goes something like this. We asked Naledi to help us demonstrate a point about saving. She was given one marshmallow and told she could eat it now or save it for later and receive another. <laughs> we know saving can be hard, but the rewards are worth the wait. We can see that people are able to use willpower to resist temptations, even from a very young age. But willpower is not bulletproof. So research has shown that willpower can break down when we're stressed or tired, and it gets depleted over time. So if you have a job that's stressful or requires a lot of intense concentration, chances are by the end of the day, your willpower isn't going to be so great. Luckily, we have another weapon in our arsenal. Pre-commitment. And pre-commitment is when we take steps now to prevent our future self from being exposed to temptations in the future. Now, one of the most famous examples of pre-commitment comes from the tale of Ulysses and the Sirens. Uh, the Sirens had a very, very enchanting song. It was so enchanting that any sailor who heard their song would sail towards it and crash his ship onto deadly rocks. Now, Ulysses wanted to hear the song, but without the unfortunate side effects. So what he did was he had his crew bind him to the mast of his ship um, and, and ordered them not to release him under any circumstances. So when he heard the song, he didn't have to rely on his willpower to prevent himself from steering the ship towards certain death. Now, of course, there are more modern versions of pre-commitment, and I've used many of them myself. So, for example, I never ever buy unhealthy snacks at the grocery store because I know that if they're sitting in my cupboard at home, I won't have the willpower to resist them. And during my PhD, uh, I would make plans with my best friend to meet her for yoga at 7 in the morning. I would never have had the self-control or willpower to do that on my own, but the added, added social pressure kept me on track. So all in all, we can see that pre-commitment is a really effective tool for self-control. But just how effective is pre-commitment? How well does it stack up against willpower? If you only had one tool in your arsenal, uh, which one would you want? Or if you could only teach one strategy to your child, which one would you teach? When my colleagues and I uh, looked to see the answer to this question, uh, we realized that no one had ever directly compared willpower and pre-commitment side by side. So that's what we set out to do in our experiments. Now, our studies were in large part inspired by the classic marshmallow studies. But instead of kids, we tested young men. And we figured that marshmallows probably wouldn't be that tempting for young men, so instead of marshmallows, we used enjoyable pictures. <laughs> and I can't actually show you an example of the kinds of pictures that we use, but essentially they were sort of our own version of the sirens. 
So we had the men come into the lab and we showed them hundreds of these pictures. We had them rate every picture for how much they liked it. And then we divided the pictures into two sets. Um, one set was the pictures that they liked just okay, and these were the small rewards. And the other set contained the pictures that they liked a whole lot, and these were the large rewards. And then we faced the men with a choice. Would they like to view a small reward picture immediately, or a large reward picture after a delay? In other words, we asked them whether they wanted to wait uh, for the large reward, just like the little kids had to decide whether to wait for the two marshmallows instead of giving in to the single marshmallow. So to test the effectiveness of willpower, we presented the men with the small reward, and they could access it at any time uh, just by pressing a button. But if they waited long enough, then the large reward would become available. So the stronger the men's willpower, the more likely they were to successfully wait for the large reward. Now, we wanted to directly compare the effectiveness of willpower against pre-commitment. So in the pre-commitment test, we added an extra step. Before the men were exposed to the tempting small reward, we gave them the option to pre-commit to the large reward. So if they chose to commit, then they would wait for the large reward without being exposed to the tempting small reward. But if they chose not to commit, then the, uh, they, they would have to rely on their willpower uh, in order to wait for the large reward. So how did pre-commitment stack up against willpower? Well, first you can see that the small reward, rewards were pretty tempting. Um, when they had to rely on their willpower alone, um, they were only able to su successfully wait for the large reward about 50% of the time. But when we gave the men the option to pre-commit, they were able to wait more than 60% of the time, and that was a significant improvement. We found something even more remarkable when we looked at what kinds of people were able to benefit the most from pre-commitment. So it turns out there's a wide variation in willpower in the population. Some people are really good at willpower and others not so good, including in our sample. So we split our volunteers into two groups. The low willpower group, we'll call these guys the Homer Simpsons. And the high willpower group, we'll call these guys the Batman. And then we look to see uh, how much each of these groups were able to benefit from pre-commitment. And what we found was that the men with the lowest willpower, the Homer Simpson types, were able to benefit the most from pre-commitment. Now, what we really wanted to know was what was going on inside the human brain that makes pre-commitment so effective. So together with my colleague Tobias Kalencher, I asked my volunteers to lie in a brain imaging scanner. It looks like this. And using a method called functional MRI, we were able to identify which regions of the brain were involved in willpower and pre-commitment. So here are some of the regions involved in willpower. This is a slice of the brain going sort of like this. So we have the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex sort of right about here and the posterior parietal cortex a little bit further back. So when you're resisting a temptation that's sitting right in front of you, these brain regions are responding intensely. Now, for pre-commitment, we saw a different set of regions. So first, we saw the frontopolar cortex, which sits right here at the front of the brain. It's actually one of the most recently evolved regions of the brain. And we actually weren't that surprised that this region would be involved in pre-commitment because other studies have shown that this region is involved in thinking about the future and mapping out plans of action. But we found some other results that were perhaps a bit more surprising. So for example, we found that the reward network was sensitive to opportunities to pre-commit. This is centered here on the ventromedial prefrontal cortex deep in the middle of the brain. And the reward network was the most sensitive to pre-commitment in those men who could benefit the most from pre-commitment. So the Homer Simpson types, their ventromedial prefrontal cortex responded wildly when they had the opportunity to pre-commit. And what this suggests is that the brain is able to anticipate the benefits of pre-commitment just when it sees an opportunity to pre-commit. In other words, it, it, it sort of codes for whether pre-commitment is potentially a good idea. And we saw something else uh, when we gave people the opportunity to pre-commit. 
the frontopolar cortex increases its communication with the willpower regions. So what this potentially suggests is this communication could give the willpower regions an extra boost that they need to guide behavior towards committing to the long-term goal. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, looking at the behavior, we saw that pre-commitment was a more effective method for self-control than willpower. And we found that pre-commitment is especially effective for those men who had the weakest willpower. And we found this to be a really inspiring result because it means that if you have bad willpower, you're not doomed to fail at self-control. You can use pre-commitment to reach your goals. And what we found inside the brain really resonates with this idea. Our brains seem to be wired in such a way that simply giving someone the opportunity to pre-commit could physically make them more able to achieve their goals. So this suggests that we can just design our environments in such a way to take advantage of the brain circuits that already exist in our heads. And some designers have already started to do this. So um, just to give a couple of examples, this is clocky. It's an alarm clock. And if you hit the snooze button on this alarm clock, it jumps off your nightstand and runs away from you beeping. <laughs> so you have to get out of bed in order to turn this thing off. And uh, this is a software called Self-Control. I really use this a lot, actually. Um, you can set it to block yourself from certain websites, so whatever distracts you, Facebook, Twitter, news sites, whatever. And it locks you out of those websites permanently until the timer runs out. Even if you restart your computer, you can't, you can't reset it. It's, it's great. Um, and these are just a few examples. I think there's a wide, wide range of opportunities to take insights from psychology and neuroscience and use them uh, to, to design smart technologies. So imagine a freezer that you could program to lock the ice cream after 8 p.m. Or a credit card with a chip that you could set to prevent yourself from buying cigarettes or donuts or Prada, whatever your poison. <laughs> So I'll just end here with a quote from Einstein, which says, once we accept our limits, we go beyond them. And I think this captures, to a certain extent, why I'm so passionate about psychology and neuroscience, because understanding and studying the human mind is about discovering our limits so we can create hacks to get around them. Thank you.